Welcome to Varm Blog, and today I'm talking once again about Jean Baudrillard. Baudrillard, for many people who don't know, is kind of a bet noir for me. His ideas are in my head, I wrestle with them, sometimes I get them wrong, sometimes I find them to be brutally true about elements of the left that we are dealing with, sometimes I find them to be so nihilistic as to be somewhat repulsive. But they often speak to things that we are contemplating now because he was contemplating on the changes of our history, our history being the capitalist post-enlightenment West, quote unquote. So I'm going to read from one of his later books um, called The Agony of Power. This was released, I believe, originally in 2010 it was written in 2007 just before Baudrillard's death this is from a chapter called the right terror of the world order and i'm going to expand on it as i read it i'll tell you when i'm reading Baudrillard and when i'm speaking absorbing the negative continues to be the problem when the emancipated slave internalized the master, the work of the negative is abolished. Dominion becomes hegemony. Power can show itself positively and overtly in good conscience and complete self-evidence. It is unquestionable and global. But the game is not over yet. For while the slave internalizes the master, power also internalizes the slave who denies it. And it denies itself in the process. Negativity reemerges as irony, mocking and auto liquidation internal to power. This is how the slave devours and cannibalizes the master from the inside. As the power absorbs the negative, it is devoured by what it absorbs. There is justice and reversibility. Now, this is kind of a reference to the dialectic of the slave, um, and it's all very abstract are the master and the servant dialectic and Hegel. Now, there's all kinds of racial problems with this with this metaphor. Don't think I don't know it. But there is a fundamental here that there is a, a kind of broad speaking psychological truth that when you are cynically joking and being ironic about one's place in society, one is still participating in that society and even accepting its rules, however cynically you think you see through them. Back to Baudrillard. A catastrophic dialectic has replaced the work of the negative. Critical thought or any attempt to attack the system from the inside is in a complete euphoria. After voluntary servitude, which was the secret key to exercising dominion, one can now speak instead of involuntary complicity, consensus, and connivance with the world order by everything that seems to oppose it. Pause. Ever notice all these right-wing and left-wing movements seem to empower elements of the status quo? Images, even radical critical ones, are still part of the crime they denounce, albeit an involuntary one. What is the impact of a film like Darwin's Nightmare, which renounces racial discrimination in Tanzania? It will tour the Western world and reinforce the endogamy the cultural and political autarky of this separate world through images and the consumption of images. And yet, at the same token, all critical negativity, all the work of the negative is abolished, devoured by science and simulacra. In the context of hegemony, the, world, the historical work of critical thought, the relationship of forces against oppression, radical subjectivity against alienation are all virtually in the past. Simply because the new hegemonic configuration, which is no longer a configuration of capitalism at all, I disagree with Baudrillard on this, we'll come back to that, has itself absorbed the negative and used it as for a leap forward through the meanders of cynical reasoning, our tricks of history. The absolute negative, terrorism, internal deterrence, responds to the absolute positive of positivized power. When, dom when dominion becomes homogen uh hegemony, which means it's normalized and accepted. Negativity becomes terror alert, terrorism. 
thus hegemony is metastable is the metastable form because it has absorbed the negative but by the same token lacking any possibility of a dialectical balance it maintains an infinitely fra inf it maintains infinitely fragile it remains infinitely fragile its victory therefore is only apparent in its total possibility in its total positivity this reabsorption of the negative anticipates its own delusion and is therefore both the twilight of critical thought and the agony of power the, the reverse effect, however, the system enters a catastrophic, uh, catastrophic dialectic. But this dialectic is a far cry from the Marxist dialectic and the teleological role of negation. For the strategy of the development and growth is fatal. It entirely feels it fulfills itself in the final achievement that no negativity can hinder, and it becomes incapable of surpassing itself upwards, off hibong and thus processes in self-annihilation, aftibong in the sense of in the sense of dissolution, aftibong meaning sublation or uh, transcend uh, synthetic tra uh, transcendence or something like that in Hegelian uses of German. For the system in the context of global power, the strategy of development and growth is fatal. The system cannot prevent its destiny from being accomplished integrity realized and therefore driven into automatic self-destruction by its ostensible mechanism of its reproduction. This is a shape is similar to what is called turbo capitalism and as turbo it should be taken as literally into the expression. It means that the system as a whole no longer is driven by historical forces, but absorbed by its final condition. Hasten to its definitive end, like a turbo engine sucking in the space in front of it, creating a vacuum and force of attraction of a vacuum. It is not progressive, continuous evolution, even if it's confrontational and contradictory. Instead, it is vestigious, irresistible attraction to its own end. If negativity is engulfed by the system, if there's no more work of the negative, positivity sabotages itself in its completion. At the height of hegemony, power cannibalizes itself, and the work of the negative is replaced by an immense work of mourning. In other words, things become sclerotic by their own complexity and success. The inability of anything to compete with it and thus drive it to drive Congress, capitalist system, whatever, to reforms that might able, able it to adapt and sculptify actually stagnates. And in its stagnation, it's actually won. It is winning that stagnates it. Just like there being no other option is why capitalism is particularly incoherent right now. We can't even forget about capital and capitalism. Didn't they reach the point where they would destroy their own conditions of existence? This is ironic. Uh, Baldurat's making fun of Marxists here. Can we still speak of a market or even of a classical economy? In its historical definition, capitalism presided over the multiplication of exchanges under the auspices of value. The market based the law of value and equivalency, and the crises of capital can always be resolved by regulating value. This is no longer true for the financial flows and the international speculations that far surpass the laws of the market. And it's interesting that Baudrillard is writing this right before the recession. Um, in 2007. Can we speak of capital when it is faced with its exponential strategy that pushes capital beyond its limits in a whirlwind of exchanges where it loses its very essence and is dispersed in an unbridled circulation that brings about the very concept of exchange to an end? I don't know if this is true. Uh, this is me talking. Having lost its rational principle, the principle of value, exchange becomes total, total at, just as reality. Having lost its reality principle, becomes total reality. It may be a fatal designation of capital to go to the end of exchange towards the consumption of reality. In this case, we are bound for a generalized exchange, this frenetic communication and information that is a sign of hegemony. The dimension of hegemony that is different from that of capital and is different from the dimension of power in its strict political definition. It is no longer a question of political power tied to history in a form of representation. Representation itself is lost in this principle, and the democratic illusion is complete. Not through the violation of rights, but through the simulation of values and the derealization of all reality. The masquerade again, everyone caught up in the signs of power and communicating in the rigged unfolding of a political stage. Now, while that's written in kind of obtuse... Uh, 
post-Hegelian philosophical terms, there's a lot in it that I think is true. One, um, that we have seen a moment where politics is both hyper-partisan, as in partisanship is everywhere, but since the communities that supported partisanship at a local level have really dissolved, it's not partisan. It's not partisan in a stable way. So you have a hyper political subject that is also anti political. No one is involved in the institutions except at the national level, where they can project their identity onto the values of the national institution. But that, in and of itself actually removes you from acting politically. It removes you from doing the local steps that you need to do to have an effective political model. But we've seen that throughout society as social media politics amped up, first in ways that seem to favor the left. People may have forgotten this, but green revolutions, Occupy, etc. And then in ways that favored the right with the rise of um, kind of Trumpism emerging out of the Tea Party's initial conciliation with the Republican Party. Neither one of them, however, really changed the status quo, and that becomes pretty apparent when you look at things. Let's go back here. Now, Boulder, I was going to speak in more concrete tenses. With the election of Arnold Schwarzenegger as the governor of California, you're deep in the masquerade where politics is only a game of idolatry and marketing. Think Reagan, think Trump. It is a giant step towards the end of the system of representation. This is the destiny of, uh, the destiny of contemporary politicians. Those who live by the show will die by the show. This is true for both the citizen and politician. Citizens is in quotation marks. It is the imminent justice of the media. You want power through the image? Then you will die through its replay. The carnival of the image is also self-cannibalization through the image. One should not conclude too hastily with the degradation of American political practices as a decline in power. Behind the masquerade, there is a vast political strategy, certainly not deliberate. It would require too much intelligence. That's what I think. That belies our eternal democratic illusions. By electing Schwarzenegger, our Bush's rigged election in, in 2000, in this bewildering parody of all the systems of representation, America took revenge for its sustain, of which it is the object. In this way, it proved its imaginary power because no one can equal it in its headlong course with democratic masquerade into the nihilistic enterprise of liquidating value in a more total simulation than in the areas of finance and weapons. America has long had a head start. This is extreme and an empirical and technical form of mockery in the profanation of values. This radical of scenery and total impiety of a people, otherwise known as religious, this is what fascinates everyone. This is what we enjoy, even though even through rejection or sarcasm. This phenomenon, vulgarly, a political televisual universe, brought to us to a zero degree of culture. It is a secret of a global hegemony. I say it without irony, even with admiration. This is how America, through radical stimulation, dominates the rest of the world. It subs as a model while taking its revenge on the rest of the world. What is infinitely superior to it in symbolic terms. The challenge of America is a challenge of desperate simulation, of a masquerade it imposes on the rest of the world, including the simulacrum of military power, carnivalization of power, and that challenge cannot be met. We have neither a finality or a counterfinality that can oppose it. In its hegemonic function, power is a virtual configuration that metabolizes any element to serve its own purposes. It could be made of countless intelligent particles, but its opaque structure would not change. It is like a body that changes its cells constantly or remaining the same. Soon, every particle of the American nation will come from somewhere else, as if by transfusion. America will be black, Indian, Hispanic, Puerto Rican while remaining America. It will be all the more mythically American in that it is no longer be authentically American. It will be all the more fundamentalist in will that no longer have a foundation, even though it never had one since the Founding Fathers came from somewhere else. And all the more bigoted in that they have become, in fact, multiracial and multicultural. And all the more imperialist in that it will be led by the descendants of slaves. This is a subtle and unassailable logic of power. It cannot be changed. Now, I'm not going to read a lot more of, of this, but I want to talk about what 
Bolger was hitting at. In many ways, he's writing just before Barack Obama became president, even though Barack Obama himself is not the descendant of slaves. Power can wear any mask. It doesn't necessarily have to look like the wasps of the world. And focusing on wealth disparities and whatnot often are hiding who has the wealth within certain groups, too. The mask remains. And the irony is there. The cynicism is there. Think about what I've been talking about for the past five years. Well, I'm still not on board with everything Baudrillard says. I think capitalism still works like capitalism and the truth. I am seriously considering parts of this in light of elements that we think about now in terms of uh, um, in terms of all kinds of problems that we see, but the center, the power, all of the DSA's rebellions against the Democratic Party, of which we must remember its, its rise to Trump was saying that the Democrats failed you. We need something better. All they could produce was Hillary Clinton and look what it brought us. Has now led them to be pretty much aligned to the center of the Democratic Party. They have been recuperated in some real sense, at least in terms of strategy. Individual chapters, DSA itself might not be fully recuperated. But the way in which it orients towards a party and whose center is a center who has maintained a lot of Trumpian policies that themselves were just accelerations of Obama policies. The power in the system has fundamentally stayed the same. Now, does that mean things would not be worse than the Trump? They probably would be. And Trump saw, seems like he was particularly incompetent in crisis. But one of the things we can say is, despite the initial changes under the Biden administration, so much of the administration still looks just like it did in the past. And it's mostly a tonal and coherent shift. Without radically changing the nature of, uh, of our political economy and the nature of our relationship to power, that isn't going to change. You can't twinkle around with it. You can't mess with it with just monetary policy. The monetary, but printing one singular coin isn't going to fundamentally change that relationship. You have to fundamentally change the way politics is done. And you have to do it both vertical and horizontal at the same time. And that's hard. It's very hard. But otherwise you are left up to stochastically rating for the conditions to just match what you want to happen and... At that point, you might as well just be waiting for the second coming. I would like to thank my patrons for these short episodes. I will continue making them. Um, I have some new uh, patrons that I need to shout out. I would like to thank uh, Ben H. And... Josh H for their support. Thank you so much. Um, if you'd like to be a patron, you can find me at Barn Vlog. You can also find the podcast for free where the interviews go. Um, and on all your pod servers uh, and uh, on Breastsprout. So I hope you have a great week and start thinking about how we can prove some of Baudrillard's fatal realism incorrect. Because right now, it seems to me, we are operating under the auspices he was describing. Now, they're very abstract, so maybe they're not entirely true, but there's ways in which they definitely apply. And to that, good night. <laughs>